welcome to Northwoods Church. You're back. I hope you're back. I can't see you, but I believe you're there. Uh, it's Sunday morning, and we're looking forward to a time of worship and uh, pray that this will be an encouragement to you today. Um, I recognize that uh, this, these are still unusual days, and uh, during these days, we'll continue to worship uh, online. I, I would say to you, we do look forward to the time that we're able to worship again in person. And um, we're listening to what the governor of our state, Governor Holcomb, is going to allow, what um, Mayor Winicky is going to allow. And uh, when we learn things, um, we will be in touch with you. Uh, we'll communicate to you through Facebook. We'll communicate to you through mass emails and uh, we'll we'll be in touch with you in every way possible about uh, when and how we will be back together again and in the meantime let's just be praying for each other you pray for um, pray for our leadership and let's be praying that we are the salt and light that we are supposed to be in the community and concerning this morning we would ask you to Feel free to, to text CONNECT to 812-214-1987. Feel free to uh, let us know how we can minister to you through that CONNECT card and how we can pray for you throughout the week. Uh, we are excited about our time of worship this morning. And uh, let's focus on the Lord today. I encourage you to, where you are, sing to the Lord. And as we look into the Word of God in just a little while, Let's uh, allow the Word of God to do its work inside of us. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, we love you and we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your faithfulness and for your grace. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for paying the price for our sins. I thank you that this Sunday morning, it is another reminder that you are alive. You have conquered death, conquered the grave, that there is nothing that we will face that we have to face, believing that we are defeated, for you have reminded everyone who is your children that, Lord, we are more than conquerors through you who have loved us. I pray, Father, today that as we worship you, that, Lord, our focus would be on how great you are and what you have done for us. I pray that as we look into your word, that your word would come alive as your Holy Spirit takes it and reveals truth. I thank you for the opportunity over these next few moments to focus on you. May we do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Wherever you are, I encourage you to sing to the Lord. I sing for all that 
you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Sometimes the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing. you've done for me worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the king who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. And you would take my place. And you would bear my cross. You would lay down. I sing for all that you've done for me. You were healing in the pain. You 
were shelter in the storm. Hallelujah, you restored my soul. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I hear you singing over me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It covers every part of me. My soul is silent, I am found, and it's a beautiful sound, a beautiful, beautiful sound, a beautiful, beautiful sound, a beautiful, beautiful sound. If you have your Bibles, would you take them and turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to uh, begin a new verse by verse time going through the book of 1 Timothy. The overarching theme to this new sermon series is the master plan for the church. Um, the church just, matter of fact, I think it was the last Sunday we actually physically met together. We adopted a master plan. Uh, just before this pandemic began. And uh, that's going to be, we're going to hang out for a little while before we act on any of that, just to see how everyone is, see where we are as a church, and see where the economy is. It had been the plan to begin First Timothy um, before the coronavirus ever happened. And if you sit back and think about um, the church, whether we are in this building or not, the church of Northwoods continues on. And 1 Timothy is a, a, a letter that will describe from Paul to Timothy how is the church supposed to operate. Um, and Matthew gives us this little short when we go through the book of Matthew, we went through this little short journey, um, and now we we begin a new journey in First Timothy, revealing how a church should be designed in its leadership, how we ought to treat each other, and what we should do. The theme verse of the book is First Timothy chapter three, verse number fifteen. We'll put that on the screen for you, and it says, "If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave." and the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. That the purpose of this, of this letter is that you would know how you ought to behave in the church. It answers the question that in this letter what a church should look like. Not from the outside in, that's what the church voted on for a master plan, but this letter describes what the church should look like from the inside out. This is the true master plan for the church. Knowing that the church is a people, not a building. We're a who, not a what. So what should we as a people be doing and acting like according to the scriptures? Let's compare ourselves to what we see in 1 Timothy and see if we measure up to the Lord's master plan. Before we read today's passage, let's look at a little bit of, of background if we could. And so the themes that you're going to see throughout the letter, I'd like to give you a theme to each chapter. There are six chapters. And I would encourage you at some point in time to write above each chapter these themes. So the theme to chapter one is the church's doctrine. The church's doctrine is what we're going to be looking at for the next two weeks. And so when you hear the word doctrine, I want you to think teaching. What should the church be teaching, and how should the church be handling correct and incorrect teaching? Chapter 2, the church's worship. So that's what Paul's going to be addressing in the, concerning chapter 2. Chapter 3, the church's leadership. What, what should leadership look like in the church? That that's not, uh, any church can do whatever they want. Evidently not. There's a plan for leadership within the church. Four, the church's moral conduct. So now this, this will assume 
This will assume that churches have trouble with moral conduct. For the record, they do. There is a problem with moral conduct in the church. And so what Paul's going to address in chapter 4 is how do you address moral conduct? Chapter 5, the church's social responsibilities. And then when we get to chapter 6, the church's attitude towards possessions. How do we handle what we own? The early church in Acts 2 sold everything they had, put it all in one big pile, and then divvied it out. You'll notice if you're a part of Northwoods, we've never asked you to give us everything you have and we'll put it in a pile and give it away. Paul addresses Timothy about how to address the church concerning possessions. And he's not going to tell everybody to become a communist. But he is going to tell them something very clearly about possessions. Today's passage. Would you read with me, starting in verse 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urge you, When I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons... By swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Let's pray. Father, I pray that in the next few minutes, your word which is alive and active, would do its work of cutting where it needs to cut, convict where it needs to convict, and comfort where it needs to comfort. I put my trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice with me who the author is. I'm always grateful when I don't have to guess. Um, Letters would often begin with who is writing uh, who is writing and to whom we don't have to guess because the first word in 1 Timothy chapter 1 says Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope too Paul is clearly saying I'm writing this letter not only am I writing this letter I'm I'm writing this letter as an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus. I am his apostle, and I'm writing this commanded by God to write it. Now, there's there's a clear uh, line, if you would, of authority. Paul's writing it. God tells Paul to write it, and he writes it to Timothy. That's a pretty clear command. There's a pretty clear order, God, Paul, Timothy. Uh, That doesn't happen in, in my world. It's not like God, Bobby, and anybody else. I, 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 don't, I, don't get one, I don't get those words other than through this. When I, I have it through this, then I have an order of command. Who's the recipient of the letter? Look at verse 2. To Timothy, my true child in the faith. And notice we know not, not only who the recipient is, the letter is written to a young pastor, Timothy, 
who was pastoring a struggling church. And Paul even calls him my true child in the faith. He's a, I read John Stott says he's in his early to mid 30s pastoring a struggling church. One person said he could be as young as mid to late teens pastoring this church. Um, when you take but in any condition, he's a young pastor pastoring a young church, struggling church. Struggling not in its size, struggling because of the issues that they're facing. And by the way, when you take 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, they're considered the pastoral epistles. They tell young pastors how to set up a church and how a church is to, how to live out its daily life. And the church that's going to stick out in days like we're going through today, in these modern days, will be a church that looks like the scriptures tell us that it should look like. Because to be honest, a lot of churches that that are in society and in southwest Indiana will not look like what the master plan of this church that's about to be described in 1 Timothy will look. A little, some information about Timothy. Timothy came from a mixed marriage. His mother was a Jew. His father was Gentile. Timothy traveled with Paul on his first missionary journey. Timothy became circumcised in order to not hinder ministry among the Jews. Notice how the letter begins now that we have who wrote it and who is written to. Um, in verse 3, you see the real content of the letter, and it's going to begin with a warning. To understand the warning, for those of you who have your Bibles where you are, and let me say, if, if you don't have one, I want you to hurry up, run, go grab one. And if you have one on your, your, your phone, pull it out and I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to actually take them and turn to the book of Acts because when you go to the book of Acts what you're going to find is that there are um, you, you find the story of how the church of Ephesus began so, so some things about how, how it began Paul's on a missionary journey and he's in Corinth and when he's in Corinth he meets a couple of people Aquila and Priscilla he, Aquila and Priscilla become um, friends and Aquila and Priscilla go with Paul from Corinth to Ephesus. While Paul drops Aquila and Priscilla off in Ephesus, Apollos comes in. And Aquila and Priscilla teach Apollos some doctrine. And the church in Ephesus begins to grow. Paul comes back. He finds believers. And he stays in Ephesus for two to three years preaching the word of God. Paul spends more time in Ephesus than anywhere else. He stays in the word of God. He, he, he preaches the word of God. He gives them the word of God. And, and he saw the town of Ephesus change. Why am I bringing up Ephesus? Timothy is pastoring in Ephesus. And he sees this town change. How much is it changing? Look in Acts 19 and look in verse 23. It says this, about that time, uh, if you go back a verse, verse 22, this will not be on your screen, but it says in verse 22, having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. And about that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith, he made silver, shri silver shrines, I'll say that three times fast, of Artemis brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades. So this guy, Demetrius, he's making false gods. He said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. You see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may, be, may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worshipped. Wouldn't that be a great testimony 
if we could say here in Evansville, we can't say people are turning in false gods, but couldn't we? Wouldn't it be great if we, if we saw the church of the living God, people turning away from worshiping all kinds of things and running to Christ? And that's exactly what is happening here. Paul ultimately leaves, turn to Acts 20. And when he leaves, in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 25, he leaves with his heart broken and with a warning. Watch it. In verse 25, and now behold, he's talking to the elders in Ephesus. Now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Now, picture that. He, he knows this is my last conversation with you. I testify to you this day, I'm innocent of the blood of all. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves, to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, watch this, fierce wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. He says, he says, watch it. From among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Watch how the letter begins. Paul left Ephesus. Ephesus. No, notice those last words. And the first thing he does in verse 3, as I urge you when I was going into Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. The first thing he says is this, don't leave. Why, why, would, why would you say that? Why would Paul tell that to Timothy? Because he was thinking about leaving. Don't leave. In 1996, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Yeah, 25 years ago, 24 years ago. Average, average pastor stayed at a church 3.6 years. 24 years ago. Average pastor today stays at a church six years. It has gotten all the way up to six years. Six years is still not a long time. Timothy is discouraged enough that the letter has to begin with remain. Don't leave. Don't quit. Talk to a pastor um, had been at church for more than 30 years and I said, tell me about your experience. He said, the first 10 years were golden. The next 10 years were good. And the next five years, I felt like I'd stayed too long. He was still there. I, I, I say that to say, staying is not always easy. I would even say staying hard Paul tells Timothy you stay right there a normal letter that Paul writes I, I'd encourage you read, read the first chapter of every letter Paul writes almost every letter Paul writes you know how he begins a letter I am so thankful for you 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 you know what's missing in 1 Timothy chapter 1 He's not thankful. He calls Timothy his true child in the faith and doesn't mention one time how he's thankful for Timothy. He says in verse 3, remain in Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons, certain persons, not to teach any different doctrine. The letter begins with a warning. And Paul's warning goes to these unnamed certain persons 
Timothy and everyone else would know who he's speaking to. As a matter of fact, later in the chapter, uh, twice in our passage today, he's going to call them certain persons. Later in the chapter, he's going to mention two people's names. It's like he can't help it. Hymenaeus and Alexander. Oop, certain persons. Got, got to blob it out. Paul's warning became realized from Acts 20. Certain people are going to rise up from among you. They are wolves in sheep clothing. And these false teachers, what will they do? They perverted the law of Moses. Look at verse 4. They, do, they, they, they teach a different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God. That is, two words, by faith. These teachers did not communicate the simple truths of the gospel. Salvation by grace through faith alone. But instead they communicated things that are extrapolated out of scriptures. They, they would teach out of the Old Testament the begats. The endless genealogies. They majored on minors. We, we don't have a lot of people teaching on begats around here. We, matter of fact, I don't know of anybody teaching false doctrine in Northwoods. But what does it look like? People teaching on, let me tell you what, the six, what 666 is. The meaning of 666, the mark of the beast. Let me tell you who the Antichrist is. Let me, let me, tell, you, let, let, let me tell you why you shouldn't use drums in the church. Let me tell you why in 1988 Jesus is coming back, or 1999 or 2000 Jesus is coming back, or 2020. Let me tell you what the coronavirus really means in the sense of the end times. They love going deep. In 1 Timothy 4, these people, the example of these false teachers, they were forbidding people to marry. They were adding to the law. And belief affects behavior 10 out of 10 times. Look, the scriptures are enough. The gospel is enough. If, if people complain because Northwoods is, is, it seems like every time I go to church, I keep hearing the same sermon, good. If you keep hearing the gospel here, <laughs> praise God. Keep coming back and hearing the gospel, and may we be a people who receive it and give it away. I don't know a better message. Receive it and give it. What, 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 what's, what's the goal of this little command? Look at verse 5. The aim of our charge is this. Love. Love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. The goal here is, is it, the best way to be uh, loving to a church is to call out bad doctrine. When this love happens... There is, verse 5, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. But if you let bad doctrine go on without calling it out, there's a problem. Paul's second letter to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, he says this. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent. And one version says, study. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We should be people who are rightly dividing the word of truth, not striving about words to no profit. Paul's warning is based on the fact that if a local church is not regularly given the Word of God accurately and taught how to divide the Word of God, understand the Word of God for themselves, wolves and cheap clothing start popping up. Oftentimes, little groups in the church 
follow this fake stuff like saccharin. Those that Timothy had in the church were growing because they were not being called out. Verse 6, verse 7, certain persons by swerving from these have wandered into vain discussion. Watch this verse 7. It's so interesting. Desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. They desire to be teachers and they are really ignorant. They have no idea what they're saying. An Egyptian zoo insisted it did not paint a pair of donkeys to look like zebras. But Cairo's International Garden Municipal Park became a target of ridicule after an Egyptian student, Mahmoud Sarhan, posted images on Facebook of the suspicious beast. The zoo's two zebras were obviously painted donkeys. It has come to the understanding that sure enough, they painted the donkeys. Zoo director Mohammed Sultan told a local radio station his zebras are real until the paint came off. Things will look real for a while. But in the end, the truth will be found out. Even false religions use the Bible. As a matter of fact, you'll see some commercials on TV that says, if you'd like to have a Bible, we'll send you a free King James Version of the Bible and have a Bible study with you. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will show up at your door and give you a King James Version of the Bible along with the Book of Mormon because you cannot understand that King James Version of the Bible except through the Book of Mormon. Sounds good. Deadly. Deadly. Look, I, I don't like standing up here and saying that there are groups out there that send people to hell. but there are. And Paul's telling Timothy, if you don't stand up against these certain persons, you're wrong. So are we. And so so here's what Paul does in the passage. From chapter 1, verse 7, it's like to chapter 1, verse 18, it, it, there's a skip. Uh, it's, it's like a. And there's two um, rabbit trails. Paul's thinking about the law, and in verses 8 through 11, he goes on a little bit of a tangent about the law because they just perverted the law. And then in verses 12 through 16, he starts thinking about the gospel, and it's on a tangent. And so I, I want you to see it as there's two little rabbit trails. We're not, we're not going to be able to deal with both rabbit trails today because of time. But one of them we can. And he, he's going to, he, these false teachers, they perverted the law. The second thing that they do is they don't understand the purpose of the law. And that's what this, this little rabbit trail is about. He, you don't understand the purpose of the law. Well, what's the purpose? Look at verse 8. Now, we know that the law is good if, that's a little, it's a little word worth underlining, if one uses it lawfully. There's a lot of things that you can say with that same statement. Preaching is good if you use it the right way. Cooking is good if you cook the right way. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can say with that same statement. The law is good if you use it the right way. These false teachers were wanting to major on the law, and they don't even understand the law. Law is good if you use it right. 
they studied the law and they never applied the law because they never understood it. Well, well how do you understand it? Well, here's what the law does. The, the law, isn't there a song, I fought the law and the law won? I, I, let, let me tell you, the law will always win. Every time I, I, I've used this in an illustration before, every time I, it's the truth. I, they just, it's just showing you the sinfulness of my own heart. Every time I see a policeman, I hit the brake. It don't matter if my, if, my, if my speed limit's below the speed limit, I'm still hitting the brake. I'm, I just always, every time I, see a, every time I see a policeman, I'm nervous. It's like, I, I, my, I promise you, my, my picture is not up in the post office. I'm okay in that way. But I always feel guilty. That's exactly what the law does. The law makes the guilty guilty. The law... Police don't pull you over and say, hey, 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 I just wanted to tell you, you're the best driver I've ever seen. When the blue lights come up behind you, the blue lights, and you come up and you have to pull over, that they are asking you for your driver's license and your registration and your insurance card. That's not a good day. Even if you get a warning, your heart's going because they're there to tell you you've done something wrong. This is what the law does. Paul, 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 Paul tells you, verse 8, the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners. And he's going to give us a big list. Here comes the list. And it's an incomplete list. It's this incomplete list of, of the sins that cause the law guilty and we're all guilty. Here it comes. For the ungodly, the sinners, the unholy, the profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers. Uh, that's not me. I've never hit my mom and dad. For murderers, I haven't done that. Sexually immoral, I'm okay. Men who practice homosexuality, haven't done that. I'm good. Enslavers, I'm okay. Liars, uh-oh. Perjurers, huh? Whatever else is contrary to sound Doctrine. This is a list that hits every category so that we all understand we have all failed. You say, Hi, what do you do with this? We've not all sinned alike, but we have all alike sinned. What do you do? Can, 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 can I... Because I don't want to end the sermon in a, in a bad mood. We don't, we don't want to end without hope. Could, could you just look forward to just a few verses? You're in chapter 1. Look down at verse 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Praise God. Watch this. Remember who wrote this? Paul. Of whom I am the foremost. <laughs> Paul just said, I'm the chief of sinners. Put me in the line. If, if there's a line of sinners, put me up front. What's our tendency? There's a bunch of sinners. Uh, that's not me. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. No, you, you want to embrace grace, you need to be able to admit that you're a failure. You need to be able to admit what he's done for you. He's taken you from X and he's given you grace. Paul said, God demonstrated his love towards me and that while I was still a sinner, he died for me. Verse 11, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. The law 
is good when used the right way. It's revealed I am a sinner because it pointed me to a Savior. I don't need more law. Don't give me more law. I got enough law. Don't add to it. I needed law to point me to the one who died on a cross to pay for my sins. Now, I can't fix my own sins. Only he who died on the cross could. For the last 20 years, sociologist Peter Simi has spent time with and studied white supremacist groups and the individuals who have been in white supremacist groups. Many groups such as the white Aryan resistance, Nazi lowriders, public enemy number one, have allowed him as an observer into their private meetings. Peter Simi explains how difficult it is for those leaving the groups and he gave a specific example. A young woman named Bonnie and her husband were fully indoctrinated and committed committed to white supremacist beliefs. In a domestic dispute unrelated to their white power group, a relative shot their daughter. At the hospital, two black daughters, two black doctors saved her life. This changed Bonnie and her husband, who then, quote, tried to retrain their minds, free themselves of racist views, end of quote. They even went so far as to move to a nearby Southern California area with numerous black and Latino families. Things became undone one day when Bonnie realized she had received the wrong order after going through a local drive through restaurant. The clerk refused to correct the order when she went inside. All the workers were Mexican and did not speak good English. Bonnie became enraged. She swore at the clerk, told her to get out of her country, exclaimed, quote, white power, and left displaying the Nazi salute. After that eruption, Bonnie collapsed in her car outside of the restaurant, crying, asking herself, why'd she do that? Why did she revert back to a state of hate she'd been trying to push away? It was clear to Peter Simi, the sociologist. She felt shame about how she'd reacted. Peter Simi believed that for many, being part of white power groups becomes like an addiction. Those who try to quit hating usually will relapse because racism burrows deep into the psyche and merely leaving the group cannot expunge it. He calls this the hangover effect. He's tried to get mental health surface for some white supremacists who are on the fence about leaving or have already left their hate groups. But few counselors will agree to take them on. And Peter Simi says their response is, we're not qualified. And that's the end of the story. Do you know the answer to sin? It's not to retrain your mind. The answer to sin is not to turn over a new leaf. It's not to try harder. It's not to find hope in what you see vertically or horizontally. It's to find hope in what he's done on a cross. Forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ and it's available to you today would you bow your heads with me if the law keeps pointing that you're a sinner and you've not received forgiveness of sins you can receive that right now and I want to encourage you right now call on him for forgiveness of sins wherever you are ask him to forgive you change you 
save you. And know that he will. Father, I come to you. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for your faithfulness to us. I thank you for the truths of your word. And I'm grateful. We're able to look into your word today and see that there is hope. I thank you for what you have done for us. Help us to find our hope in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I ask Darren to come and he'll lead us. Thank you, Bobby. If you'd like to respond to the message this morning, there's several ways that you can do that. Uh, someone will be available right after this service uh, to talk about your next steps to take with the Lord. Uh, you can call the number that you see there, 812-499-5569, and uh, someone will be available to talk to you. If that number is busy, uh, leave a message, and, uh, and someone will get right back to you as soon as it is freed up. And we would love to talk to you. Also, you can connect with any one of our pastors uh, with the numbers that you see on the screen. They are uh, also, if you're on the website already watching the, uh, the, the broadcast, uh, you can go to uh, the pastor section on the website. And, and there is a link there to be able to email any one of the staff there. And we would be glad to talk with you. Also, we mentioned earlier the virtual connect card uh, you can text the word CONNECT to 812-214-1987. And maybe you already filled out a CONNECT card earlier in this service and, uh, and, and sort of turned that in, submitted it there. But uh, the Lord has dealt with your heart and you would like to make some sort of response to the sermon. Uh, feel free to fill out another CONNECT card there and let us know what decision you would like to make and, uh, and be obedient to the Lord and respond to His uh, is working in your heart this this morning. We also want to mention some of the uh, things that uh, we have tried to set up during this time to help you stay connected with the church. Uh, the Northwoods podcast is continuing on. We're doing two of those a week that uh, sort of tells what's happening as we're learning information and how we're responding to it, what the church is doing that. There's also some uh, teaching, some uh, some interesting things that uh, you can find there. If you'll go to the website, on the main page, there is a, a link where you can go right to the podcast. And all of the podcasts are available there. If you'll scroll down underneath that initial one that you go to, you can listen to any one of the podcasts there. Also, during this time, if there are ways that the church can be available to you, let us know how we can help. We would love to be of benefit to you during this time. Sincerely, uh, if you'll just let us know if there's, uh, you need somebody to run, get you something. If you need help in any way, we want to be available to you. And, uh, and just uh, let us know and we'll, we'll do what we can. Now is the time when we would typically do an offering here at the church. Uh, we invite you to go ahead and give in uh, the ways that are provided there uh, as a part of your worship. Uh, you can give through uh, give online at northwoodschurch.org slash giving. That's right on the website. There's also a link on the home page where you can uh, where you can give, uh, or also you have can text to give uh, by texting the word give to eight one two two one four nineteen eighty seven, and that will you know, set you through a series of prompts that will invite you to 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 give. If you put in your information there. Uh, you'll need a check the first time, but after that, uh, you can log in, and uh, it will help you to be able to give regularly. I found that's a really easy way to give, and it would invite you to do that. It becomes uh, a way of obeying the Lord's command to, uh, to tithe and give your offerings to the church. Uh, you can do that during uh, that time. Well, uh, that is our service for today. Uh, we are really glad that you joined us today, and... Uh, just want to pray God's blessing on you as we finish our service. Thank you for joining us this morning. Let me pray for us. Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for your word. And we're grateful for the truth of Scripture. Help us to be grounded in it. And uh, Lord, I pray your blessing on each person watching this morning. We ask that you would direct them, give them your presence during this time. We're grateful for you. And we worship you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much, everybody. Hope you have a great rest of the day.
into the night Say a prayer, turn the tide Dry your tears and wave goodbye Step into a new day We can rise